Uh, we are uh, in another psalm today, and psalms have kind of some central ideas, and one of them last week was... Ripping and praying? No, 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 that's this week. Last week we talked about, or actually Jeremiah talked about, trust. Trust in you, trust in him, trust in you. And uh, from various psalms, today we're going to talk about Psalm 31. <coughs> in uh, kind of an in introduction, I don't know why it's always me. Um, <laughs> I was griping this week and fussing and carrying on. Uh, I, I went to a house, you know, I'm, you know I'm an electrician. I went to a house that they were having some trouble with the disposal. And it's like, I don't even have a disposal. Why are you complaining about not having a disposal? But, you know, they had a disposal and it wasn't working. And so, and, and I got there, and not only was a disposal working, but the plug on the right side of the, um, where, everybody's running around here. <laughs> the, uh, we, yeah, yeah, so there was one in the back of the cabinet I had to get to, so I had to scrunch down and get to that and deal with that. But there was always, but, but there, was, there was a plug, GFCI, you know, you kind of you have a, plug, a little button you have to push and it goes off and all that. But it wasn't working at all. And so what I, what I did, a guy that, that had come, and he was, he, was, uh, he was actually owns a body shop over here on Westmoreland in Illinois, uh, young guy, and he was, he was there and... So I open this, take this outlet out of the wall, and all the wires and everything just fall off and part. And it's, and it's like, <laughs> and you know, it's, it was like both of us were looking at it, and we're kind of saying, "I wonder if that was the problem." And so, and it was, and it was, it was, a, it was aluminum wire, which you have to deal with differently, and they didn't do it right. And so the people, it was done not too long ago, which always is not good when you have to go back after somebody and fix their mess ups and so and it was hard because had, it was all back in the back and I and the, the wire wasn't wasn't long enough and I, actually I should have just said we're going to stop right here and we're going to tear all this apart and we're going to put new wire in because this is, you can't get onto this wire but I, I in, in my uh, great professionalism and talent uh, finally got I'm, I'm teasing finally got it on and the the GFCI uh, back in the wall, and it was working. And all the whole time that I was doing it, 90% uh, of the time I was griping to myself. And uh, every once in a while I would go, you know, something would go on, and, it, and it would, then it would kind of fall apart. <sighs> you know, and I, I'd, actually the guy was sitting in the living room, and, uh, <clears throat> and I had to go, I'm sorry if I'm sounding frustrated here a little bit. That's all right, I understand. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's in business. And so... Yeah, I, I was griping under my breath uh, also, and is that all right? Uh, sometimes it is, actually, as we're going to see in this psalm. Uh, but th th this title here I, I put on Psalm 31 is griping and praising, and it's actually more like uh, uh, praising and griping and praising. In my case, the first part was ignored, and we just went to the griping part. And I'm not sure if I got to the praising part, uh, maybe a little bit later, but I was praising when the thing worked, and, the, and I found out that there was actually an old switch that was bad, and it was working, and, you know, after I put a new switch in, it worked, and, and so it all worked when I left, and so then I was praising because everything was right, but in the, in the midst of it, there was some griping going on, and I don't know, of course, you guys never do that griping stuff, right? Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody not do the griping stuff? At least you're honest about that. See, uh, this psalm kind of breaks down into two sections. One section is is uh, prayer, uh, finding security uh, in God uh, during difficult situations, and the second one is is basically a declaration of praise. Uh, first is one through eighteen, and the second one is much smaller, nineteen through twenty-four. Uh, and some actually look at the second part of this psalm and, and wonder if it was actually a different psalm that got stuck on the end of this one. And I, I don't think so. It was probably all part of the same same psalm. But the first the first verse is, is, "In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me." Now, what does this tell us? about the situation of, of David. It's a call for rescue and for refuge. 
okay? But, it all, but that, that tells you something, is David is in some kind of difficulty and trouble right from the beginning. You know, he's saying, I am in, in trouble. I need to be rescued. I, I need uh, redemption in some sense. And, and he's call, talking to God about this, and he looks to Yahweh to rescue him. Uh, this, is a, it, 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 this whole psalm is put in covenantal terms. This is Yahweh, who is the king. Uh, he is part of the kingdom, the, the, the nation of Israel. He is probably at this point king. And, and so he's in this covenantal relationship with God. And so he is in trouble, and he's looking to God to, to rescue him from this trouble. And the rescue is based on God's character, his righteousness. Now, as we look at this, we do not know what the problem was. Uh, there's all kinds of problems as you look at David's life <clears throat> that he could need rescue from. Uh, he could need rescue from uh, the, his uh, rebellious son, Absalom. Sometimes people say that's what this psalm is about, but it doesn't say specifically. Uh, other psalms do. Uh, it could be he, he's not king yet, and he's running around from Saul. Uh, it could be other issues, other troubles that David finds himself in. The biggest one is the rebellion with Absalom and his uh, trusted people, uh, trusted staff that kind of some of them go with Absalom, his son who rebels, but it, that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't say that specifically. But there is trouble and there is persecution in David's life. Uh, now, can we identify with that? Anybody? No, I mean, identify with difficulty and trouble. I mean, not just with the last year of stupidity and COVID, but the the all of us can it can identify with with this difficulty. That the question is how we deal with that difficulty, how we respond to difficulties we find ourselves in, whether it's an outlet or whether it's something bigger than that. For David, it was a huge thing, apparently. Uh, and God listens. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. So right at the beginning, he says, I am in trouble. I want to, have, I want to be rescued. I desire rescue. And he looks to God, and he talks about God's character and who he is and his, his, his strength and his power. And he's compared to uh, a rock. And, and this is a rock. If you come into uh, Yosemite National Park, uh, you, there's one road that you come in, and, and this is kind of what you're, as you come in around, you see this, which is, does anybody know what this, this is? Anybody know what rocks these are? That in the middle is called Half Dome. It's in Yosemite. Uh, people, you can come up the back of it, which is the easy way. I've never climbed uh, Half Dome. I've climbed some other rocks in, in um, uh, the Sierras, but never Half Dome. There's an easy way to kind of, well, it's sort of easy, but it's, it's easier than climbing up the face. This is the face of Half Dome uh, it, it, right here, and people actually, actually climb this, this, and this is El Capitan right here, by the way. Uh, this is a famous rock face that people climb. Uh, recently, there's been a couple climbers that have cl free climbed it in a day, which has never happened before. Uh, usually, it takes several days, and they have to sleep hanging on the side of the cliff. It's really crazy. But anyway, that's El Cap. Now, do these ro these rocks? There's earthquakes and stuff in uh, in California, but these rocks really don't. They're pretty stable. They they don't fall down. Okay. Uh, this this right here is. Anybody know what this is? Masada, Masada. and it's it's a. Uh, this is a rock, and this is the fortress, the Israeli fortress on top uh, of Masada. Masada means a, a strong foundation, and and this is later after David. But this is kind of what they, these are not uncommon in the Middle East. Rock fortresses. That's why it says a rock fortress. You're a solid rock fortress, and so it, that's the. I can't believe you did this. I may go back to cutting down trees. Because they, they don't turn off. Uh, and so this is a rock fortress. And, and 
that's what, that's what David is thinking about. So God is our refuge. Uh, and so then he, go, and by the way, there's something that's, that is kind of compared to this, is Psalm 23, which we did, we kind of sung, sung today, right? That was one of the songs we did today, Psalm 23. And the, what is Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Um, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. And, and so the second part, the second part of this, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. That's very similar. For your namesake, you will lead me and guide me. Now, this David wrote both Psalms. We don't know if he wrote Psalm 23 first or this one first. It, you know, even though they're, it, you know, 23 is first, but we don't know which one was first. But, but this is a, this is a real uh, reality for, for David as he was a, what, shepherd. And he, he kind of looks at God as a shepherd of him who will lead and guide him into the path of righteousness for his namesake. For God's name, his reputation, his people are connected to it. And David said, You're con we're connected and you are our king, and please rescue us for your name's sake, your righteous, holy name. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's kind of, it's, it's like God is, a, is also kind of a shepherd here that he leads and guides. He's a rock, and he's a shepherd. And David, again, he is in, in some trouble. He, see God, he sees God's powerful righteousness, and he... he uh, he sees God as one who hears. He sees him as a shepherd who leads and one who saves and one who comes to the rescue. In verse 4, you will pull me out of the net. Uh, and he's, you were looking at the scriptures, right? And, and you will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Now, this is a story about the mouse. Now, God is what? Bigger than a mouse. You know, and God has the power to just reach in and pull you out of that net. And this is this kind of the thing that David is thinking about as a hunter who puts a net down. And that it's a, the enemies are putting a net over him. And he knows that God can reach in and has the power to pull him out. He absolutely can do what he says he does. And to your hand I commit your spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord God of truth. Where, where have we heard this before? Does this, you have, you have a remembrance of this someplace? Who else said this? Jesus on the cross, as he said, crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. He had a total trust in Yahweh the Father. And David, who wrote this under the guidance of the Holy Spirit first, uh, sees God as trustworthy. Um, into your hand I commit my spirit. Soren Kierkegaard was an existential philosopher, he, and he was, uh, I believe, a Christian, and, and he talked about a leap of faith. Uh, Kierkegaard's leap of faith I wouldn't exactly agree with because he said we really can't know for sure we can't you know it's like the evidence really isn't there but we just kind of le have a leap of faith into the in, into God and as one of my history professors said he think he, he thinks Kierkegaard leapt, leapt right into the arms of Jesus which is a reality because Jesus is the one who is trustworthy here God is the one the father is the one who is trustworthy. I don't know if you guys have, have, um, have ever done that, that kind of um, silly um, deal where, where you, you, you uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, it it's a trust kind of game where two people kind of ha ha grab hands or something and then somebody says, you just kind of fall back, you know, close your eyes and fall back and you're supposed to trust these two people to catch you. Has anybody done that? I have. I, don't, I was like, this is kind of dumb. But there's a reality to it. There's a trust. You know that they're there. You know, you saw them to begin with. You, 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 you maybe smelled them, but I don't know if you didn't. But, 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 but if you fall back, you know, that's a trust situation. I put my hands, I put my life, I put my soul into you, and it's Jesus, and it's for D David, it's Yahweh. 
Then he picks up uh, trust with a, a contrast here. There, there, there's two things here. There's truth in the end of, um, there's truth and then there is um, love. And you're going to be seeing this. It, there's, there's truth. He is the, the true one, O Lord, God of truth. He is truth. There is truth. There's something above us and beyond us that is and it doesn't make any difference what we think about it. It is, God is truth, and he is love. And you see these two things uh, over and over in Scripture. You see them over and over in the Psalms, the loving kindness, the hesed of God, the, the uh, truth of God. But here it's put in, in a uh, broken up by something else, which is idols. Uh, there's a contrast, there's a break here between the, the truth and the love, which you see oftentimes connected in Scripture. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. So, <clears throat> some, some, of the, the, some of your translations, especially the English Standard Version, uh, in, an, in a note says, you hate. It's not I hate, but you hate. Uh, some of the translations have that. Some of the, the I think the Latin does. There's a few translations that have you, but probably it's I. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. We can look to deliverance in two different places, right? What are the two places? One, we can look to, to the idols. What, what does that mean? Does that look, mean the little stones and stuff that are, or, or people make idols? Yes, that's part of it, but what else is it? Anything that replaces God, okay? Anything that we think can give us success, can, can pull it off for us, other than God, okay? Now, there, obviously, there's things that we use in this world like money and, and <clears throat> the options to do things in our own work and stuff like that. But if we are only focusing, if we focus on those and we think those are going to make it for us, we miss the boat and we made them idols. Whatever they are, maybe it's a cultural thing that we're, we, we, we kind of <clears throat> identify with and we think this is going to make it whether it's right, whether it's left, whether it's center, whatever, you know, and I have, you know, I, I look at the world and I say, you know, and, I, and but what do we need to do? We don't look at that is going to save us. There's no person here that's going to save us. It's Yahweh. That's the person who's going to save us. That's the person. That's why there's a check mark by Yahweh. He is the one that is going to save us. He is the one that we trust in. He is the one that's going to ultimately bring us success, that's ultimately going to pull it off for us, that's ultimately going to save us out of the net. And he sees that and he understands that. And he puts that for some reason in the middle between what's normally together, truth and love. Although oftentimes there's, I wouldn't say oftentimes, from time to time there is something in between that breaks up truth and love. And what, it, what is it? something that is not truth, okay? This is what we don't focus on. We focus on the truth, God. We don't focus on this, and then it's like, why? Because of his love. Because he, as a person, cares for us. His loving kindness is for us. Now, why does he say hate, okay? What, what, I hate those who regard vain idols. What does is, what, what is he say? You know, for us, that's a little, that's, I think, why it, it, in some of the translations, it's, it's changed to you. Because God can hate things that are bad, right? But we can't hate things that are bad. So it must have been a mistake, and so we'll put you in there. But really, David says, I hate those. Well, one, he is the leader of, of Israel. And so as the leader of Israel, he can make statements uh, about bad things, okay? And he does not like people who present idols as that which will bring people and himself success and sa salvation, okay? In fact, he goes to the point of saying, I hate those people. And there's a reality to that even to us today, by the way. If, if people are peddling idols, whether it's, you know, within the church, whether it's in the community, whether it's in, the, you know, whatever it is, they're peddling something other than God that they say that will save you. That is not good, 
and there is a reality that they're identified with that, and they are pulling people away from truth. And that's why I think David says, I hate those people that regard idols. But Yahweh loves Hesed. We, along with David, rejoice in this. He sees, God sees our affliction and he knows our troubles. This is a parallelism in, in Psalms and Hebrew poetry. He, he sees our affliction. He knows our troubles. He understands where we are. He understands that. And, and, and he's not, he has not given us over to our in, enemies. In verse 8, and you have not given me over to the hand of my enemies. You have set my feet in a large place. Look at the, the contrast here. He, not only has he not <coughs> put him up to, <coughs> not, a, not only has he not given over to his enemies, he's put them in a large place. He's put him in a large place. And this, this is like, he saves him from the enemies and puts him over into blessing. And this is what, and David has not really, it doesn't seem like he's quite experienced this yet. But that's what he sees God is doing. And I think he's experienced this in the past, but right now he's looking to that future. And he keeps him safe, and he, he blesses him. So life is, would be good for David. Now, who are the enemies? I, I don't know. Anybody that's against God. Anybody that, that is against God's program here on earth. That's the enemies. God keeps him safe, and he puts him in a large place. And then there's a little more complaining. He does call for God's grace in verse 9. <laughs> Be gracious to me, O God, for I am in distress. And then there's a list of complaints. All right, this is where we get to the rule of complaining part. For I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, for my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my body has wasted away. Because all my adversaries, <coughs> I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. You get this picture? You know, David's in a bad way. He's in grief. You know, his neighbors don't like him anymore. You know, he comes along in the street, and his acquaintance sees him, and they turn around and they run away. How would you like that to be your life experience? That, and David is complaining about that through verse 11. Fails, walk, wasting away, sorrow, siding, failed strength. Uh, why? Because of sin. Now, I don't think this is only because of sin, <clears throat> as we'll see in a second, but, and this is not the focus of 30, 31. 32 and 51, that's the focus of those psalms, is David's sin. But David's sin is not the focus here, but he acknowledges that his sin has a part in his distress, that we are all sinful, and that, da that David's sin has a part of this distress and he calls for grace in this situation because that's all that that's the only thing it's going to be is God's grace and then also his adversaries are having a part in his difficulty because of my adversaries I've become a reproach especially to my neighbors and an object of dread he's a complaining and and all the way through 13 but I trust in you. But I trust in you. No matter, I mean, here he is explaining all this stuff, that's, the, the, all these problems. But his trust is in Yahweh. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My life is in your hands, in verse 15. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let me see your nature and love and, and not be ashamed, not have others ridicule. And so he's, and, and disregard my enemies in 17b. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let the, them be silent in Sheol. I, unfortunately, it sounds like he's calling for their death. You can't do that. <coughs> Only the king can do that. Uh, let... Let, let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. Notice the character issues of his adversaries, okay? They lie. They spew out falseness, and they show, they spew out badness, if that's a word. Is that a word? I made it up if it's not. Badness. They are bad. Uh, there's a few times in my life I've experienced 
uh, people telling lies about me. Has, has anybody experienced that in their life, whether it's at work or whether it's in a, whatever situation it is? <clears throat> it's not pleasant. And that, that, will, and that is one of the things that, uh, by the way, will tell you if somebody is an enemy. Now, we, we don't like to talk in terms of enemies, but somebody who is not walking with God, this is, this is, these are the characteristics that you will see. One, they're liars. Okay? They do not tell the truth. Remember, Yahweh, truth. Adversaries, lying. They lie. They spew out badness. Okay? Now, what does that mean? They spew out bad things. They talk bad things. And all you have to do today is listen to our culture, and there's a spewing out of badness. That tells you something about the culture. Okay? And, and it's like it's, what, all cultures have issues. All cultures have difficulties. But when you hear people spewing out things like, we need to support a woman's right to kill their baby before they're born. That's badness. When they spew out things of other types of things, that's badness. When they make those things good, that's badness. The nature of the enemies. And there's the second section. Okay, characteristics, pride and contempt. Um, how great is your... Those are the second two things, pride and contempt. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you? How great is your goodness? Before the sons of men, you hide them in the secret place in your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter with strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me, a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications. O love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful. The, and fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. How great is your goodness in verse 19. This is a declaration. This is the second part. It, the God is good for those of faith. His, great, his, his uh, goodness is great. That's one of the great characteristics of God is His holiness. That's one of the primary characteristics of God is His goodness and His greatness. But His goodness, and how great is that goodness for which you have stored up for those who have this relationship for you, that regard God, that regard Yahweh, that take refuge in Yahweh before the sons of men. You hide them in secret places. You, you, you thought I was abandoned, but no. In verse 22, as for me, I said in my alarm, I'm cut off from before your eyes, but not really. And then he ends this psalm like this. Oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully rec recompenses the proud doer. There's two types of people, as we talked about in Sunday school. Godly ones and the proud doer. God is going to deal with the proud doer. He's going to save the ones that are godly. And then he ends with hope. Those that hope in the Lord, this is reality. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Let your heart take courage. All you who hope in the Lord. Where did that come from? A relationship with God. You know, this whole song was about how God is good, powerful, loving, righteous, and our response to it. What's our response to that? It's a response of faith and trust. Does, can we complain? Yes. 
But that complaint needs to be in the context of the reality of God, of who He is, that He has us, that He can save us, that He can preserve us, that God has the power and, has the, and is a God of love that takes care of us. Even as we look at the, the difficulties in this world, we know our future, and that's what we hope in. We hope in the God of the eternity that we will be with him, that he will save us. And as we walk in the midst of difficulty here, no matter what it is, God is faithful. And then we fall back into the arms of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you are God. We thank you that you care for us, that you are our one who is great, is righteous, is loving. We thank you that you are strong and that we can identify with things like rock and a fortress. We thank you that you take us out of the net of difficulties. Help us trust. Help us have faith in you. And Father, as we walk in this difficult world, our hope is in you. In Jesus' name, amen.